until we can we can get started. Okay, yeah, welcome everyone uh, to today's um, seminar on physics uh, meets ML on our online seminar series. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Lode Poli from uh, Munich today uh, with us. Um, Lode is an expert in quantum Monte Carlo simulations with applications in solid state physics, atomic and uh, molecular physics. And he's a professor at the University of Munich and has been very interested um, in exploring machine learning, uh, which is suitable for theoretical physics. And uh, today we are very excited to hear about his work on discovering unknown phases of materials that we haven't known about. So we're very excited uh, to hear about um, your, your work, Lode. And please, at any time, ask questions in the chat or unmute yourself whenever you want. Um, we're happy to have questions. Okay. okay. All right, uh, thank you, Sven, and hello from uh, Munich. So today I would like uh, so I would like to thank Sven and uh, Jim and uh, Fabian and all the others for setting up this very nice series and inviting me. And today I would like to talk uh, about our ongoing project in machine learning, um, in which we try to develop an algorithm to discover new phases of matter with unsupervised and interpretable machine learning, which is a slightly provocative uh, title. Uh, so please interrupt me any time if you have a question. Uh, I'm also looking at the chat, I have the window open, so I will try to address questions that I see there as well. So um, before we start, let me uh, thank uh, my collaborators, Postdoc Kerl Yu and former PhD student Jonas Greitemann, as well as the new members, Nihal Rao, uh, Nico Sadouni, and uh, a bachelor student, Mark uh, Machacek. Um, and so let's get started. Okay, um, so uh, as Sven said, uh, my background is in uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and to uh, give you an idea of the problems we face, we typically have two types of problems. Um, so we are talking about numerics for strongly correlated condensed matter physics or um, called, called atoms in the, in the realm of quantum simulation. And the biggest and foremost problem is how to get good data. So given a model, how do we get good data for interesting, say, fermionic models? Um, and this is very uh, challenging, is an open question. Um, and there is no uh, unique answer uh, to do so, despite lots of progress in recent decades. Um, the second question is how to analyze the data. So if you have data or very good data, then a number of possibilities may happen. You can have symmetry breaking, you can have topological order, you, you can uh, investigate critical points or you want to uh, have access to dynamical information of phase. And this is the kind of uh, physics question that you would like to uh, finally address. But you can only do it when you have good data. Um, and it may come as a surprise to you that the second step can also be very uh, challenging, even uh, although the first one is, of course, the crucial step, but the second one can still be very challenging, especially uh, if you have uh, complicated, uh, frustrated magnets. For instance, as you see in the picture here, which is a Kagomi lattice, um, to analyze the orders that may happen here can be far more daunting than uh, you may think. And so the approach I'm going to outline today addresses the second uh, big question. This is how to analyze the data. Um, it does not answer how to get the data. It assumes that you have good data uh, that are representative of the system you want to uh, study. Um, so uh, it can in particular address questions of symmetry breaking and it can address uh, questions of local constraints, but it cannot uh, address Wilson loops. It cannot address topological order. Um, this uh, is still open. Okay, um, to give you an example that orders can be complicated, um, here is uh, taken from uh, this paper in Science by Patterson et, et al. Um, you see a material that is, that is uh, gadolinium gallium garnet and it consists of two interpenetrating Kagomi lattices in this 3D structure, which is a bit hard to visualize. And it turns out that such a complicated structure has actually some kind of hidden order. Namely, you can identify 
this kind of a plane, which is a weird combination of the two interpenetrating Kagomi lattices. And it turns out that the physics is planar in this. Okay, um, and uh, this means that you actually need to look at uh, an animatic tensor. You need to look at the rank two tensor that defines this plane, which is a, a director. So you have to first of all identify the spin cluster of these 10 spins and then look at quadrupolar orders uh, of this order. And this is not something that you would immediately see in experiment in neutron scattering either. But these are the kinds of questions we would like to address. Can we figure out orders of this type that maybe you have not seen before that are hidden, uh, but are physical and relevant? Okay, let me move on. Um, so the tool we use is a variant of uh, support vector machines. And uh, let me quickly go through uh, the basics of an SVM uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. So in a support vector machine, uh, you are trying to define uh, a classification. So you want to find a separation between the green data and the red data. Green means they have some property that distinguishes them from red. And in the uh, standard formulation, I'm, giving, I'm given training data, and this data is, is labeled with the property, and I try to find the hyperplane that best separates these two sets of data. Um, so you see here this straight line, and the margin is kind of optimal. Um, data that are on the margin are called support vectors. So this hyperplane is uh, specified by the formula omega dot x minus uh, b. And so uh, we can define a decision function where this function omega x minus b is positive for class 1 and negative for uh, class minus 1 for the red. Okay, um, now that in itself is uh, nice, but it's kind of restricted to a straight line or a hyperplane, which is very restrictive. Um, and so far, it does not deal well with, with misclassified data. So the first thing that is uh, introduced next are slack variables. So you assume there is a certain degree of misclassified data that you see here in this figure. Um, and this you can still add uh, to uh, the solution by adding slack variables. This is well known. Now, what gives support vector machines their true power is uh, that there is a kernel trick. So there is a mapping from your input space to some feature space. Uh, and although the, the data are not linearly separable in the input space, they are linearly separable in the feature space. And this mapping phi does not need to, know, need to be known explicitly in general, um, but it is a kind of a, a trick. For instance, if you use a quadratic kernel, you can now have circles and ellipses that classify uh, the data here. So you see that a quadratic function can perfectly separate red from green, but the linear line would not be able to do so. And this is where the power uh, of the SVM uh, comes into play. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the success of your classification depends on the choice of your kernel. Um, we will work with quadratic um, kernels, uh, as you will see uh, in a minute for, for physical reasons, ultimately. OK. Um, now, this mapping always works under very general and mild assumptions um, that I don't need to go into uh, detail here. OK, now uh, SVMs have been used, and the idea of phase classification that follows it ha have been introduced in the literature before. Uh, there were papers three, four years ago from uh, Lei Wang, uh, who used the PCA for the Ising model. There were papers by Karaski and Melko, um, using convolutional neural networks uh, for Ising model and Ising gauge model. And there was a paper by Ponte and Melko, which uh, did also use an SVN, uh, also for the Ising model and the Ising uh, gauge uh, model. And so we are especially building on the latter. OK, now uh, let me uh, tell you the, the key idea of, of what we have done. So uh, let me illustrate it for the classical 2D ferromagnetic Ising model. Uh, that you know from statistical mechanics. So you have, let's say, 2D lattice, and you have spin, classical spin degrees of freedom that take a value plus or minus one on every side, and some ferromagnetic exchange uh, between nearest neighbors. 
Um, this model has two phases. At high temperature, it's a disordered paramagnet in which the magnetization is zero. And at low temperature, it becomes a ferromagnet. And there are two possibilities. Either the magnetization is one or it's minus one. So all the spins point up or they all point down. And a typical snapshot would look like this at zero temperature. Whereas if you are close to the critical temperature, uh, you would see a typical snapshot like this in which you have large clusters of down surrounded by large clusters of up. Okay. Um, now, how would the phase classification problem for the Ising model work? Um, now, if you look at this decision function that I introduced uh, before, and you use a quadratic kernel, then um, it doesn't take long to realize that the decision function can be written as in the following way. So you have the sum over all lattice sides A, the sum over all lattice differences, so lattice distances X away from A, uh, a some structure constant C X A, and then the spins sigma on site A and the spin sigma A plus X. And then there's this constant bias term, um, which uh, then takes the value plus or minus one uh, for the support vectors. Um, so this is the, the, the form of the decision function. And so if you do machine learning, you would like to learn B and C X A from snapshots, uh, as you've seen on the previous slide. Um, of course, we know from physics that the average magnetization squared, so the magnetization squared is a perfect order parameter, is a perfect separator between the paramagnet and the ferromagnet. And we also know that the magnetization squared is the sum over the spin correlation function. So if you interpret this as the spin correlation function, then this whole sum will give you the average magnetization if the constants are all constant. And this is indeed what the machine has learned. So what you see here is a representation of the structure constant CXA, and you see that it's essentially a constant. Okay, so from CX, so you revert now the argument. So from CX, which is given as the output of the machine, you can reconstruct the order parameter and say, okay, magnetization squared is a valid order parameter for this transition. And this is why uh, SVMs are interpretable in this problem. Yeah? So this was the work by Ponte and Melko. Um, and now, uh, what do we do? So we actually build on this. And uh, th there is actually something more you can do than what I just said. And to see that, we do the following. So we first average. We average over the whole lattice. So we map the spin configuration onto the average magnetization per spin. So I just sum up all the spins over the lattice and look at the average magnetization. Okay, now there are two cases. Either I'm in the paramagnet and then my magnetization will be essentially zero. And that for any temperature above TC. For the ferromagnet, the magnetization will be either plus one or minus one. Okay, now this is now, if you look here on the, to the green circles, my phase classification would consist of finding a distinction between those points, which are the paramagnet versus the ferromagnet, which are those here. And of course, a quadratic function can easily do this. Okay, so this must also work. But the new thing is that because all the data from the paramagnet map essentially onto zero, onto the origin of my classification, problem here, they also must be support vectors. So the origin becomes a support vector. It must be exactly on the margin. That means the bias takes a specific value, plus or minus one, depending on my, uh, whether I look paramagnet versus ferro or ferro versus para. And this is now something I can do without training because I know that the phase classification must have a bias plus or minus one for those cases. And so I know without ever having seen a ferromagnet or a paramagnet that there is a distinction between these two temperature regimes, simply because the bias takes this value. And this is what we exploit. And this is how we can make it unsupervised. So what we do now is the following. We scan 
let's say, in a uniform way overall interesting temperatures, so let's say from very small temperature to very high temperature. And for every temperature point, we do a phase classification. Yeah? So if you have n points, there will be n times n minus 1 over 2 phase classification problems. And always we look at the, this, this bias value, yeah? b. If b is 1, then we know that these two data points, temperatures, are in a different phase. If b is not 1, say close to 0 or 0.5 or so, or 0.1 or very large, especially if it's very large, then we know it's, the two are in the same phase. Okay, and then we kind of connect points that are in the same phase with the line using some tools from graph theory. And this is what you see here. Yeah, every temperature, because it's a 1D axis, has been a little bit offset in the y direction. And you see that two clusters emerge, the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase. Okay, so I have now done a kind of unsupervised learning of the phase diagram. I have not ever seen, so to say, a paramagnet or a, or a ferromagnet, but already I know that there are two regimes and they are separated by a quadratic function. Okay, and this is the key idea. This is how we can make it unsupervised. Okay, um, so for the problem of phase classification, what we have done uh, is the following. So if you kind of compare support vector machines with neural networks. Typically a neural network is universal, uh, but is more difficult to interpret, whereas an SVM is generally considered more problem specific and easier to interpret. Now what we would like to do is for this particular problem, push the SVM uh, into a universal tool while keeping the interpretability. So this would be the main goal of our project. Uh, why would you want to do this? Why would you think that this is actually a meaningful thing? So the key thing is that you can read off the, the order parameter as opposed to guessing it. Yeah? To keep in mind that the order parameter is something that you have to devise, you have to cook it. But the Ising model, this is of course trivial. You immediately see it. But there are other cases where the order parameter can be hidden, very difficult. Um, for instance, if you have, uh, say, uh, a system with disorder, then sometimes you have higher order parameters that you don't see at all uh, by looking at the Hamiltonian. Yeah? But a tool like this would be able to show it to you without uh, ever having seen it. So there is a question, if you're using a binary classifier, why weren't there two distinct clusters corresponding to the two classes? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question at the moment. Maybe I think can... this might have reflected to the to the previous slide, yes. but um, yeah, Jamie might also want to unmute if you want to. Yeah, sure. So, uh, on the previous slide, uh, I was just wondering why, if you're linking points that have the same output of this binary classifier, why doesn't why doesn't it form a like a two distinct clusters? So on this slide, you want to yeah. know why there are, oh so the the way i connect you, you mean why there are still some connections between the two yeah yeah like why are there paths from the far left to the far right yeah so so you need some 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 algorithm or some rule to determine when you connect two points and when not mm -hmm. yes and so if you um what we typically do is we make it a, a kind of a, a weight function so uh, the bias can come out to be of the order of 1. It can also be 1.3. It can be 1.1. It can also be 0.9. But it can also be 5,000. Yeah. And somehow you want to make like a smooth connection of when to draw a line or maybe a sharp one. And depending on, on your uh, choice, uh, you can have less or more lines here in between. This is ultimately a question of representation only. So, but it is possible, according to graph theory, that there is only a single point which, uh, with a single link connecting the two by fine tuning. Uh, but what we rely on in practice is that, that we don't want this fine tuning, we want something robust. Uh, mm. I hope this will become clear later that uh, the, the purpose of this is to identify regions and then to figure out the order parameter we, we go uh, into pooling and to, into representative samples only to compare to figure out the other parameter. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. Thank you for the question. 
Okay, um, so yeah, my second argument would be if you follow this uh, scheme, you can actually reduce the chances of missing an order. Yeah, you can have an, a scan over the parameter regime, and as soon as something happens, you should pick it up. Uh, and finally, uh, if you have to go through a huge parameter space, this, uh, or you have to, to vary many, many parameters, J1, J2, J3, I don't know what, uh, this can give you a lot of speed up. But the main reason should be that you don't have to, to guess the order parameter, which can be very um, misleading, especially if the order is complicated. Okay, so this is the key idea, and essentially what we have to do now is more of the same, but for different models, not for the Ising model. So unfortunately, we have to make it more complicated because all simple orders have been found and identified uh, in physics. And so if you want to find something new, it has to be more complicated than the Ising model. And unfortunately, it has to be a lot more complicated. Um, so what we will use next, and this is for the experts, uh, on, uh, we will use a lot of parallel tempering for frustrated magnets. And so we have a state-of-the-art implementation and we are careful in monitoring uh, round trips. We use heat bath over relaxation, global rotor rotations, and if known, other tricks. Um, but note that the output of a Monte Carlo simulation is always an ensemble of states. And each one of them can show a manifestation of symmetry breaking in a different way. Yeah, and this is something that, that you must keep in mind uh, when comparing the data. Okay, so where are we? So uh, we had some ideas about this a few years ago, and then the, in the first project, we could discern two phases, and we were lear learning like local high rank order parameters, yeah? so it's quadrupolar, octopolar, and, and maybe rank six uh, for fun. Uh, and then we moved on to, uh, to, to, to discern multiple phases, yeah? so see the differences of not just of two phases, but of five, six phases. Uh, and then we, 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 we learned this trick, how to do the graph analysis, uh, so without supervision. Um, and then uh, we had a benchmarking case that I will show you next on, on uh, reproducing a known phase diagram for a complicated classical uh, uh, phase diagram of a frustrated magnet. And then we moved on to uh, large unit cells. Um, and so uh, as of a few months, we have some results that are new. Uh, for certain models. Um, open question is still how to do quantum systems um, and that is mostly related to the fact that getting data for the quantum system is, is, is far more challenging than for the classical system. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you an example, namely the classical XXZ model on the pyrochlor lattice which was benchmarking, the classical Heisenberg model on the Kagomi which was also benchmarking, and uh, I want to briefly sketch some new results for the gamma K model, which is relevant for very fancy Kitaev materials. Okay, um, so our benchmarking uh, project was done in collaboration uh, with the team from Okinawa. Uh, this is Nick Shannon here, this is Han Yan, and this is Ludovic Chaubert from uh, Bordeaux. Um, and uh, they needed two years to, uh, to do the analysis of the classical XXZ model on the pyrochlor uh, lattice. So here you see a pyrochlor lattice consisting of uh, corner sharing tetrahedra. Um, and on the y axis you see temperature, and on the x axis you see J plus minus over JZZ. Yeah? So it's a, a measure for the anisotropy. Uh, this is written in quantum notation, but this is uh, slightly uh, misleading if you want. Uh, these are really classical O3 vectors representing the spin. It is a classical phase diagram. Um, and they found several phases, namely there is an in-plane antiferromagnetic phase. There is a high temperature paramagnetic phase. Um, this is spin ice, which I uh, will talk about later. Um, what you see here is a biaxial uh, bi-pneumatic phase. Um, this is a kind of, in, uh, I mean, this is, they call it a spin liquid, um, but this is one that uh, satisfies the symmetry of the Hamiltonian explicitly. And at this point here, minus 0.5, um, there is a, a pseudo Heisenberg uh, spin liquid, which is also a classical spin liquid, but it's very specific for the Heisenberg point. Um, and pyrochlor physics is, uh, especially then spin ice, uh, relevant for materials such as holonium titanate and dysprosium titanate. Okay, and 
um, so uh, Nick Shannon saw this as a competition between what he called trained monkeys, uh, but make no mistake about this, this is a heavy machinery that they use. They use a lot of techniques from group theory in a very systematic way. Um, and so he wanted to see how this approach in machine learning can uh, deal with that. And he was uh, skeptical. Um, and so, okay, let's get started. So uh, what is our, uh, so to say, recipe? So we have our Monte Carlo snapshots for the pyrochlor lattice. And the first thing we do is average onto a single tetrahedron. Yeah? So this is our cluster averaging. And this is an assumption on the unit cell. So this is Q equals zero order. Um, and so we must map these pin configurations onto a tetrahedron, but we will allow for uh, tensors to be defined on the tetrahedron. So we will make uh, monomials of degree n, where n is the tensor rank that we define on the tetrahedron. Yeah, so our mapping phi, if you recall from the introduction, in this case is actually known explicitly, and it in fact reduces the Hilbert space uh, or, or the total amount of degrees of freedom compared to the full simulation. Yeah, this is a bit unusual, but that's what it is. Okay, so and now we are going to do uh, the phase classification on the tensors uh, defined on one tetrahedron. And so we do again our graph analysis and we start with tensors of rank one, yeah, so corresponding to dipolar order, and it divides the phase diagram yeah, in two regimes. There is uh, a regime here, and there is all the rest. And in this case, you will see there is actually only one point that connects it to the rest. So the question by Jamie Simon uh, is here answered more carefully. There is only one link connecting the two phases. Um, so from this, you would argue that this is probably a magnetic phase and the rest cannot be addressed properly at the moment. So we go to rank two. And in rank two, yeah, there is no more point in analyzing this magnetic phase. But in rank two, you see different regimes emerging. You see this regime, you see something here, you see something here, and you see, you see something here, and maybe something special is going on here. And of course, this is very reminiscent of the phase diagram of the Okinawa group. Uh, nothing else happens at higher rank. So order rank three and rank four, so octopolar order, and, and so they don't give uh, more insight. Okay, now let me replot this, but now with color and label. So we have phase one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we look at the bias, and whenever the bias is one in absolute value, we know that there is some kind of symmetry breaking. Yeah, so for instance, one, compared to all the rest has a, a minus one everywhere. From this, we can conclude that one is the most ordered phase. Two will be the most disordered phase. Yeah? It's the high temperature paramagnet. Um, and then um, it's more complicated. So three and five are hard to compare, uh, but three and four, there is another transition. Yeah? So this is a transition, but those values on, on one cannot compare them. Okay, so we know without having done anything special, just a classification and looking at the bias alone, which was B and now rho, we know there is a, a disorder hierarchy. We know that two is the most disordered, then six. And then there are like two paths, three, four versus five, and one is the most ordered. This already we know. We don't know yet the symmetry of those phases, but this we have to look at those structure constants. And so what we don't know yet is that Two is a paramagnet has trivial O3 order. Six is also O3 order, but correlated. Um, three is easy plane cylindrical symmetry. Five is easy, is easy axis cylindrical symmetry. Uh, four is a quadrupolar, so a kind of rank two order. And uh, one is a dipolar or magnetic order. This we still have to figure out. Okay, uh, so this was figured out without ever having seen spin ice, for instance, which is phase five. Okay, so now let's look at those structure constants. And so for phase one, this is a rank one tensor. Uh, we have four spins, three components, four times three is 12. So this matrix C mu nu nu uh, is a 12 by 12 matrix. So it's the spins on the four uh, lattice sides of the tetrahedron, one, two, three, four. And every time we have X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And it turns out that the structure of the C mu nu is as follows. Yeah, so there's a lot of zero, which is white, and a lot of one, which is blue. 
and it's actually repeating. Yeah, so it's the same for all the spins. And now if you look carefully at this, you will say, well, actually I can write this decision function, which is encoded here as S I X squared plus S I Y squared and summing over all the uh, spin lattices E. All right. And this, of course, you see that this encodes the in-plane magnetization. Yeah? So in other words, we already done. From this structure, this encodes the fact that, the mag that, that this is an antiferromagnet in-plane. Yeah? And this is how uh, we do the analysis. Of course, at rank two, it's more complicated. Yeah? So to, to know the phase four, which is this one here, uh, we have to go to, to rank two. Yeah? So now the matrix is 144 times 144 because I have to make tensors of rank two, 12 squared is 144. And now it turns out that there's again a kind of a structure that repeats itself. Yeah? So you see like super blocks and within each super block, a certain pattern that kind of seems to repeat itself. And this is now what, what, what we have to analyze. And for instance, this super block here, it has entr entrances on x, x, y, y, but also on x, y, y, x, and something on the z's. Yeah? And by carefully analyzing this, so what you have to do now is you have to decompose this block into the irreps of uh, L equal two spherical harmonics, fit it with the five uh, irreps that you know, extract the coefficients, and from this uh, we extract the fact that this is C2H. Yeah, so it's a, a biaxial pneumatic phase with two fluctuating peaks. Okay, I don't want to go into the details how this is done, but that's the rough sketch. Yeah, so these were the two ordered phases. Now, it, surprisingly, it also works for, for the classical spin liquids. So for instance, phase five, five, which is known as spin ice, which is the following. So per tetrahedron, you have two spins in the Z direction pointing inwards and two pointing outwards. Yeah, so this is the, the, the mathematical formulation of the spin ice rule. And this constraint is also picked up. You can see it actually by coarse graining these super blocks and looking at these components, but then for phase five. five. Yeah, this is how we learn spin ice. Uh, for phase three, there are also such constraints, but now you have the constraint simultaneously for X and Y. And for the Heisenberg, you have it for X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and this essentially concludes uh, our analysis of the phase diagram. We learned all the symmetry broken phases. We learned the local constraints hit hinting at classical spin liquids. And our phase diagram uh, agrees extremely well with the one from Shannon. The only difference is kind of in the crossover between the paramagnet and the other phases. Yeah? I mean, the dashed line is theirs, whereas the colors are ours. Uh, but that has to do with the, with the width uh, of the susceptibility corresponding to those constraints. And, Within this width, you can always locate uh, the crossover where you want. Yeah. So this is now, so to say, a big success. We reproduced the phase diagram that they needed two years for, and we did this in a couple of months. So it's a speed up. Yeah. So we caught up, and so we can all be happy. We did the same for the Kagome, which is one of the standard models, uh, uh, paradigmatic models for frustrated magnets. Um, it becomes a little bit more difficult because the Kagome Heisenberg, so it has only one axis, uh, at very low temperatures of the order of 0 0.004 times J, it becomes planar physics. All the spins will uh, lie in a plane. Uh, this was first figured out by Chalker uh, in 92 by a mechanism known as um, order by disorder. Uh, and so planar physics means you have, you have to you find a, a, a pneumatic order parameter, and this is what he wrote down. Um, then there was speculation about octopolar order, and the standard reference nowadays is a paper from Zhitomirsky 2007, uh, explaining in great detail uh, all these octopolar structures as the probably driving order parameter. Um, now, what you see here on the right is the representation of this octopolar uh, order parameter. Uh, and if you try to deconstruct it and write down the decision function, it of course agrees uh, with what was known from Zhitomirsky. So in this case, an analysis that took about 20 years can be reproduced very quickly. Now, if you're an expert, we did not look at dipolar order yet. So this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, we have to redo certain simulations because we, uh, at that time, only looked at uh, single unit cells, which was either a single spin or a single triangle. 
so you need a slightly larger root three root three to be able to answer this one as well. Okay, now, um, so the benchmarking works perfect, uh, but as always, if you know the answer, it's a lot easier than if you don't know the answer. Okay, now let me move to uh, the Kitaev uh, materials. Um, these are among the widely discussed physics uh, questions uh, in frustrated magnets from the last years. Um, so uh, we are now talking about 2D physics. We have a honeycomb lattice. Um, and what is special about the Kitaev model is that the interaction is different depending on uh, the bond. So when you see a blue bond, it is, for instance, an XX. If you see a red bond, it's YY. And if you see a green bond, it's ZZ. Yeah, so it's, it's, it, it looks very artificial. Yeah? You see it more carefully here. So ZZ, YY, and XX. And every side has coordination number three. So you always have three different colors, so three different types of interaction. And this is actually highly, highly, highly frustrating. Um, now, in the quantum case, one of the most famous papers that exists, I think, is the exact solution of this model by Kitaev using Majorana fermions and a Z2 gauge field. Yeah? So if you have just this model, it is exactly soluble. Uh, and it turns out that if Kx equals Ky equals Kz, you get a, a gapless spin liquid. Essentially, you get a Majorana semi-metal, uh, whereas the Z2 gauge field uh, is static and gaps out. If, however, K, one of the Ks is much larger than the other one, say Kz is much larger than Kx or Ky, then you get a gap spin liquid, which is already very interesting. However, it has a billion topological order, same as Tori code. Even more interesting, if you apply a magnetic field, say in 111, then you can actually get a non-abelian Eisenberg topological order, which is similar in structure as the Px plus IPY superconductor. Okay, now uh, you may think such a model is completely artificial and it's of academic interest, but then uh, there were papers by uh, Yakli and Kalunin, uh, and, and they were arguing that iridates uh, with a structure of 5d5 electrons and rutinates with 4d5 electrons, under certain conditions, namely you need essentially an edge sharing geometry, then there is exactly the right amount of spin orbit coupling. The U, Hubbard U, is not too strong and you get an almost an exact cancellation and it's a complete miracle in my opinion still nowadays, uh, but they argued that this is actually very close to realizing such a, a model and then indeed soon after this was quite almost re realized. Now we do have materials that hence are very close to these Kitaev materials and would have probably good overlap with such physics. In particular, the material known as uh, ruthenium trichloride uh, is nowadays generally considered approximate spin liquid and made a lot of uh, headlines uh, recently because of uh, the following. So a Japanese group here, Kasahara et al., they apply a magnetic field under an angle um, to ruthenium chloride. And whereas, so, so the material is not just a Kitaev model. There is still some residual um, type of Heisenberg interaction, and there is still definitely another type of interaction known as the gamma instead of the K, of the K which is substantial. Um, but there is a kind of a consensus that material is certainly ordered, magnetically ordered, uh, in low fields, in zero uh, field, um, probably zigzag order. But then, as you approach, uh, as you apply a magnetic field, uh, before it becomes fully polarized, there is an intermediate phase, and what is special about this intermediate phase is that it shows a quantized half integer thermal hall effect for fields around here, around A Tesla. So, so you see here on the right, you see this uh, thermal hall conductivity, and you see that it's kind of pinned to one half. Yeah. And this is essentially in the region here in the red. They cannot go to lower temperature. Um, and it's not even clear that it's possible that it would persist at lower temperature. Um, but whenever you see a Hall effect and it's quantized and actually the value is non-integer, it's something uh, very special. Um, so if this is confirmed and true and generally accepted, this would mean that you have a spin liquid. This would be a proof of it. This would be proof of topological order. This would be proof of chiral Majorana edge modes. And this would be proof of non-abelian st statistics and fractionalization. So it would prove a lot of uh, paradigms of current condensed matter physics all at once. 
So hence the interest in this material. Um, now, theoretically, this material is uh, very difficult. Um, there is essentially, I would say, almost no agreement on, on uh, what a correct microscopic parameter is. Um, so what you see here are 19 different papers, and they try to estimate uh, the value of the Heisenberg J, the Kita FK, these uh, gamma interactions, gamma prime J, 2K2, and so on. And you see that these numbers fluctuate very strongly, even the sign of these interactions is quite different. Um, and so it's very difficult to be sure what's really going on. Yeah? So uh, the gamma interaction that I mentioned before, whereas the K, Kita FK, can be thought of in spin space as a, as a matrix which has one entrance on the diagonal, uh, the gamma X has two entrances, two entries uh, on Y and Z, for instance, and the Y on X and Z. Okay. Uh, and there is kind of agreement that gamma is present and is substantial, uh, probably more important than J. Um, furthermore, the model is extremely difficult to simulate, both classically and quantum mechanically, of course, as well. Uh, different methods give often different results, and we are at the limits of what one can do there. Okay, so what did we do? Um, so we, of course, went back to classical uh, uh, physics, because that's all we can do at the moment, and we studied this pure gamma, gamma K model. Yeah? So it's a Kitai of K coupled with a gamma. Uh, and we look at all parameters, we also had a field um, in the one 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 direction. Now, um, this model has a special symmetry, namely it has a global C6R C3S symmetry. Namely, if you uh, rotate from one of the links of the hexagon to the next, and you at the same time permute the spin indices X, Y, Z, you have a symmetry. Okay, now at zero field, there is another sublattice symmetry, namely you can swap the sine of k minus k, k to minus k, gamma to minus k, and one of the spins on the sublattices. But that's only true in zero field. Okay, now we applied our uh, parallel tempering. Unit cell was very large, 72 times 72 times 2 uh, sites per unit cell, and we went down to rather low temperatures of the order of 10 minus 4, whereas 10 minus 3 is probably trusted more. Uh, and we apply again our uh, algorithm. So we start with an analysis of the, of the graph, uh, and then we try to get order parameters. And it's very complicated. So as you see here, this is our phase diagram. This is the field on the y-axis, and this theta is uh, a measure for cosine theta for gamma and sine theta for k, or the other way around. And the different colors are essentially different regions uh, in rank uh, one. And so what you see here in blue, KSL is the Kitaev spin liquid. And there's also gamma SL, which is the gamma spin liquid. Yeah? So we have gamma spin liquid, Kitaev spin liquid, another Kitaev spin liquid, and uh, again, the uh, gamma spin, and here is another gamma spin liquid. Okay? Rank two doesn't give you a lot of insight, it just gives you the dashed line, and you need rank two essentially to get a constraint for the spin liquids, uh, as we will see. Now, uh, unlike other studies, we find that the Kitai spin liquid is stable on the antiferromagnetic, also on the frustrated side. Uh, the gamma spin liquid is always a single point. The gamma spin liquid is not thought to uh, be present in the quantum model. Um, and then, well, I will limit the discussion to zero field only. Um, essentially, at zero field, we have here this S3 phase, and then we have here what we call the S3 cross Z3 phase, and then the ferromagnetic S3 phase, and then the uh, S3 cross Z3 on the antiferromagnetic side. When you add a magnetic field, uh, you get usually quick polarization of those phases on the ferromagnetic side, but not on the antiferromagnetic side. Um, and what is uh, also very notable is that if you are here in the Kitaev spin liquid and you add a field, you go through a phase in which there is like an emergent global U1, but it's a global uh, symmetry. Um, and this one kind of corresponds to the interesting uh, spin liquids with non-abelian order in the quantum case, yeah, which is believed to be the parent spin liquid of all the interesting theories physics. Um, nevertheless, I have to say, questions remain. Yeah? This is our phase diagram. This is 
currently the best we can do, um, but there are still questions unanswered. Okay, now uh, let me show you what we have for h equals zero and what is kind of uh, currently new. Yeah, so this is the same as on the previous slide, it's just represented on a ring, changing the theta only, and h is zero. And so you see now gamma spin liquid single points, guitar spin liquid a little bit uh, extending onto the uh, frustrated side. Uh, CP stands for correlated uh, paramagnet, essentially it means uh, system size is still too small to be sure at the moment. Uh, could be incommensurate, could be that it's ordered, but I, I, I don't know at the moment. Or, or temperature is too high, it's all possible, essentially we don't know, but at the temperatures we are at, it is paramagnetic. Um, okay, and so, uh, yeah, now I want to discuss slightly a little bit of these, so, so, so what is new is that these 18 sublattices here and six sublattice uh, phases we have here, we have now some kind of order parameter for them, and, and this is kind of new. Um, the structures we get, you know, these colorful matrices that we get out of the uh, SVM are, are uh, not so straightforward as for a simple antiferromagnet or ferromagnet. And so this pattern here is the pattern for an S3 phase, and this pattern is for the S3 cross Z3 uh, on the antiferromagnetic side, so it's quite, quite complicated. Um, but still this encodes some kind of order parameter. All right, so what are now these uh, phases? So the S3 phase has six sublattices. Um, and to get the magnetization, you must take the six ordering matrices of the, of the, of the symmetric group S3. And so you see T1, T3, and T5, they are the cyclic subgroup corresponding to the rotations. And T2, T4, and T6, there are the reflections around the planes 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1. Plus and minus uh, a difference for ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic side. Uh, this phase, S3, so the unit cell is shown here in blue, six sublattices, and it has its structure factor has uh, peaks at the K point. All right, so its magnetization is, is perfectly one. This is fine. It's a, either a perfect ferromagnet or a perfect antiferromagnet. Now, the complication is this S3 cross Z3 phase. Uh, so the sublattice uh, has no eight, so it's an 18 sublattice uh, symmetry. So the six in blue, the six in red, and the six in green. They all are kind of the same as for the S3 with a little bit of modulation. So there are in fact, so 18 sublattices with 18 ordering matrices TKA, but in such a way that TKA plus TKB plus TKC is zero. And what you for instance see as well is that, so T1A is the same as T1, T3A is like T3, but now it has, uh, sorry, it's like T5, but it has no minus one halves here instead of one. And T5A has minus one halves here instead of the ones there. And the B and the C have similar forms, but always in such a way that this, is con that this condition is fulfilled. Furthermore, the reflections, they have a parameter A entering, which is dependent on gamma over K. And this is a little bit strange, but it's what we find. The structure factor of S3 cross Z3, it has black points at the M points, so on, at the distance two thirds from the Brillouin uh, zone. Okay, so this is currently what we find. Um, it's a highly complicated order, and I don't think we would have found it without uh, the machine. So yeah. this is like the first time somebody tries to write down order, ordering matrices for 18 sublattices in this uh, model. Now, uh, one, yeah, one issue is that um, the magnetization is not going to one. It goes rather to maybe two thirds or two one half. Our other authors claim that it might be very magnetic, um, but essentially I'm not sure at the moment. Okay, uh, what we also learned, which is new, are the constraints for the spinning liquids. So the one for the Kitaev was, was known. Yeah, so the, the, the constraint for the Kitaev spin liquid consists of all possible diameter coverings on the hexagonal lattice. So it's on these hexagons, not on of the honeycomb lattice. Yeah. Um, so the constraint, this G, satisfies uh, this condition. So you have spin one and two, you take the y, spin two and three, you take the x, spin three and four, you take the z, according to this uh, figure. 
And on the ferromagnetic side, this must sum always to one on the anti-ferro to minus one. Okay, so this one was known. And uh, so, so this still has a local Z2 invariance, which is very good for the spin liquid nature of it. When you know this explicit uh, constraint, you can compute the ground state degeneracy, uh, which was also known for the Kitai spin liquid. Now for the gamma spin liquid, it was not known. And uh, the machine kind of figured it out. Uh, now the constraint for the gamma spin liquid does not just involve the transformation you see here, which we kind of have as a rank two uh, correlation written as G1 in this table. No, there are other types of rank two uh, correlations G2 to G6 involving either nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbors, or uh, diagonally across. Um, and the gamma spin liquid is some combination of those, uh, also summing to plus one or minus one, so fully saturated, whereas the other G1, G4, G6 must be zero. Here for the gamma, uh, for the Kitai spin liquid, G1 is summing to one, and all the other ones are zero. Um, yeah, so this is new and, and you know, this involves like 24 terms and I have no idea how one could find this unless you know how to extract it from rank two tensors from this machine learning algorithm. Uh, it has Z2 invariance, so we are pretty sure this is correct. Um, and given this form, we were able to compute for the first time the ground state degeneracy of the gamma spin liquid, which is a lot less uh, than the gamma, than the Kitai spin liquid. Um, and therefore, probably this is an explanation of why it's less stable. Okay, so uh, I don't want to say more on, on that other than that it's uh, yeah, kind of difficult and tough, but that's what it is at the moment. So the question is where, where to go from here. So our main bottleneck remains how to generate Monte Carlo data for different uh, models, especially difficult models, you know, it's very difficult to get good data. Uh, and the machine is very sensitive to having good data. Uh, if you don't have good data, it quickly tells you something is not optimal. Um, there we have another ongoing uh, project with the uh, Okinawa group, namely they looked at a pyrochlor uh, lattice, but now it's a breeding pyrochlor. So you have an A and B subtetrahedron that are different. And one of the tetrahedra has uh, furthermore jaluzinski morea interactions. And they looked at this in a recent PRL and they claimed that on this side, this, this may harbor a new type of spin liquid, namely a rank two U1 spin liquid. However, if they lowered the temperature, they found that there was some order and they were not sure. And they wanted us to analyze this type of Q equals W order as they dubbed it. And this is the work of Nico Sadune. Um, and uh, currently this is a kind of uh, a project that turns into uh, mostly like symbiosis between machine learning and uh, traditional artillery uh, with group theory. Namely the machine improved and found a ground state from which we could construct a manifold of ground states. And now they apply their machinery and they are learning uh, the fluctuations around it, but we are not done yet. Um, because uh, there is still something else going on. We have not fully understood everything. Something else is still going on that we need to analyze. And so currently this is a very tough problem that uh, we are making progress. Um, all right, what else could we do? So we could do reverse Monte Carlo engineering. So if you want to uh, figure out a microscopic model, then in principle, the approach outlined here can be used in such a way that you uh, play around with parameters J1, J2, J3. You keep varying them until the phase diagram matches with the experiment. Okay, it should be possible. Um, however, not easy. Uh, even more challenging would be to pre-screen novel classes of materials that have not been fabricated yet. yet. And okay, assuming classical physics is appropriate, so spin must be high. Um, that would be very interesting. So if you could scan over five, six parameters and know in advance where something interesting is happening and then maybe if you can then convince experimentalists that this is a material they should build. That would be very interesting, but um, we have to still make a couple of steps before uh, we can do projects of this type. Uh, quantum problems, they remain kind of difficult. The main problem is how to get data because of sign problem in Monte Carlo and inherent difficulties with uh, uh, other methods as well, um, certainly in 3D. Um, 
The other caveat is that, uh, you know, classically you have all three vectors and X, Y, Z commutes, but in the quantum world, this is not true. Yeah? You have only one axis that you can choose. Um, and you need to figure out how, how to deal with this. Yeah? So if you can do bosons, uh, or you had say you have Monte Carlo and a positive sign representation, you can look at world lines. And maybe there is a quantum to classical mapping and maybe this is okay. And this is something we want to try. Um, another approach could be that you know, if you can do DMRG or PEPs, or some kind of tensor network state, maybe you, they can generate the grounds and then maybe you can sample from it. And another approach could be, but it's very speculative, you know, we take full counting statistics or all moments of correlation functions to replace our snapshots that should also contain all the information, but it's uh, not clear how to uh, formulate the SVM in such a way at the moment. Okay, so if you uh, want to learn about this and you want to play around, we have an open source version, TKSVM open. Uh, there is a Git. Um, that you can easily find, and it contains the codes for most of what I said. So Ising uh, is a code for the Ising model. Uh, Gauge is a code that produces um, artificial uh, symmetries implemented by Gauge uh, theories, and ThrustMac is for the Kagome. Okay, now, all right. Uh, we would have liked to invite you to Munich for our summer school on machine learning together with Sven, uh, but unfortunately we have to postpone. So we'll invite you next year in 2021 for our summer school and hope to see you there. And so with this, I would like to conclude. So um, I hope I could convince you that we developed an SVM that has become interpretable and kind of universal and we applied it successfully to the XXE model on the pyrochlor, uh, but we also applied it to the very complicated Kitaev uh, materials uh, where we also found some new uh, results so far, but still, are still, are still working on it. Okay, so thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Lorde, for a very nice talk. Um, are there questions? Please feel free to write it in the chat or to unmute yourself. Maybe let me start. Um, so you, you had this comparison of um, all the theoretical kind of predictions for um, for, for for the order parameters um, that are varying very very high, uh, very much. Um, how do you compare? Like, can can you single out several ones of them that are, that are kind of similar to what you are predicting? Uh, um, you you mean in the literature? Or? Yeah, yeah. You had this table uh, where you where you were listing all the different predictions uh, that were people coming up to describe the material. Yes, yes. So this table was for was for microscopic values of the Hamiltonian J and K. Um, th these are not yet the phases. So I can show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant, I meant that. So I can show you, uh, for instance, uh, is this still on screen sharing? I'm not sure. Okay. So this is, for instance, uh, for the Kitai, a phase diagram of the uh, Toronto group, uh, Young by Kim. Um, so they vary gamma over K and H over K. Um, and so I was talking about the uh, zero field only. And um, so they claim that the Kitai spin liquid is, is essentially not stable. It's just a single point. Um, and then they, they claim for weak gamma, the phase is zigzag plus or 12 side order, and then later on it's six plus 18. Six is stabled, stabilized when applying a magnetic field. And for some reason, there are other variants of 18 popping up at larger fields. Now, um, it's not simple to interpret for me what, what they mean with an 18 sub-lattice if I, I don't have an explicit ordering formula. Um, 
they have, however, a certain structures. So there are three types in the paper of 18 sublattices, um, which are the ones here with different symmetry, you know, C3 lattice symmetry inversion, like here and, and nothing. Uh, so this has six equivalent black points at the end points. This one uh, would have only two and this one probably, I don't know if it's also two or six, I have to read it. Um, whether this is the same or not, I don't know. Um, and what the relation is with, with the six up lattice, which is here, I also don't know. And they also write something strange that, you know, like here the six side, 30 side and 70 side, whose magnetic unit cells contain this, appear like parts of the 18 side, 50 side and 19 side orders. And I must say, I, I don't know. I mean, I do know that there are special orientations of the spin in which 18 looks like six. But we think that 18 is the more general order. And you know, this is ground state. We are still at a finite, very small but finite temperature. So if six and 18 are truly degenerate, that may also influence what you see at finite temperature. So, so this I cannot really answer at the moment. But as you see from here, it's a, it's a mess. Yeah? It's, it's very complicated. I mean, 50 sub lattices is a more, it's, it's very complicated. Yes. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so you discussed the uh, interpretation of the offset term in the hyperplane learned for the SVM, uh, so the term B. Is there also some interpretation for the, the weights W that you learn in the hyperplane for the SVM? Oh, absolutely. The, the, so so the, the bias uh, we use to make the graph, but the, the, the weights W, they are my, my uh, structure constant C. Yeah, so uh, let me find the plot. Um, so, um, So, so this matrix here, this is exactly the this this W. Yeah, the seam you knew is an encoding of the of the of the W. Yeah, so the W encodes the order parameter, and the bias gives you an idea of where the phase boundaries are in our case. So, so is that a, like explicitly a of W or is that? So wait, let me uh, show you this. So the, so the way to, con to, to, uh, to look at it properly is, so the decision function contains of these Ws, which written here are these structure constants seem you knew and the bias. And so you start from Monte Carlo spin configurations, you apply the TKSVM and you look at both. You look at the row, which is, this one, and you look at the seam you knew, which is this one. And from the row, we know the topology of the phase diagram, and we have some idea of the hierarchy of the phases. But from the seam you knew, so these weights, this is what gives interpretability its meaning. This gives you the order parameter or the local constraints, depending on the, the physics. Yeah, so, so both are both exploited in full. Thanks. Thank you. So I can ask Lode usually in person as well. <laughs> um, so if there are more questions, please feel free to uh, to ask. So 
So maybe maybe one question. So I mean, already this face diagram, at least for an outsider, looks rather complicated with a lot of structure. And as as you say, um, um, if you if you turn on magnetization, it becomes even more complicated. Uh, how you know, like when you see uh, when you when you want to suggest materials or in, interact with experimentalists on you know how to build certain materials, is the situation going to be become even more complicated, even more messy? For, for these materials, or is this? Um... Yeah, it depends on the number of parameters. Right? This is, I mean, uh, I mean, this this is this is not so easy. Uh, if you have like a new class of type of class of materials, you first have to figure out what are the relevant exchange. Uh, first, you have to make sure it's an insulator. If it's not an insulator, you, you have to also add a charge. And as soon as it's in a if you are like sure it's an insulator then you can start thinking of okay what are the relevant degrees of exchanges magnetic exchanges so first you have to figure out what is the, the relevant spin this is usually not too difficult to figure out and if it's spin one half or if it's a higher spin and then you have to figure out relevant exchanges and their sign and their you know the magnitude is maybe the next thing to think about um, and when you know this you can start thinking of a, of, of a model uh, but then you want to follow this up so so you know, band structure calculations are not so easy, um, but the holy grail would be that people grow single crystals that are larger and larger, and then you want to ultimately go towards neutron diffraction, if possible at all. As long as you have to rely on, on spin wave uh, theories or band structure calculations, DFT, you know, these are strongly correlated systems, it's very tricky. Um, and when you know this, when you know your model, you can start, you know, analyzing the things here, vary all the parameters, and it depends how many there are. You know, if you have a five-dimensional space, it's, it's of course not so easy. Um, but if it's only two or three, maybe. Yeah. Um, but if, if if the system is truly quantum, like spin one half, the predictive power will be limited. Uh, if if you have five halves, it's probably classical. Yeah. But you could still get interesting dimerization effects. I mean, that you can easily miss. Uh, I mean, in our setup, you still have to think of high of onematic and optipolar phases. Of course, you will start with dipolar ones, but also the possible choice of unit cells is not uh, I mean, is not simple. Right? But it's exciting, you know. If you can predict it before ever having built it, it would of course be highly exciting. Sure. Um, are there more questions? So I cannot see, uh, see any more questions around. Um, so yeah, it was a really nice talk, Lola. Thank you very much uh, for giving this presentation. I think this is uh, really interesting to uh, to see uh, this use of machine learning here. Um, so yeah, um, we have you know as regular uh, regularly our talks are announced every two weeks. So yeah, for this um, I'd like to thank Lola again for for a very nice talk today. So thank you. Thank you.